everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Uh, as Anand said, my name is Karin Zissis. And for those of you who are new to ASCOA, America Society is a nonprofit organization dedicated to education, debate, and dialogue in the Americas. And the Council of the Americas is a business association whose members share a common commitment to economic and social development, open markets, the rule of law, and democracy throughout the Western Hemisphere. We have headquarters in New York City, as well as offices in Washington and Miami, and we convene in events and conferences throughout the Americas. And in fact, I was previously based in Mexico for eight years with ASCOA. And I really want to thank our partners, the U.S. Mexico Foundation. In addition to this program, as Adan mentioned, we co-authored a media brief ahead of this summit. Um, you can find that link in the chat. And so I want to talk a little bit about why we prepared this brief. As you all know, the North American heads of state will be in Mexico City at the beginning of next week. So we work together on this document to share context for some of the really top issues we expect the leaders to discuss, as well as others that are critical to the trilateral relationship. In particular, we focused on trade, immigration, and security. In the case of trade, we explored how integrated these three countries have become. With the U.S. trading more than $3 million per minute in goods with its neighbors in the first three quarters of 2022. During that same period, Mexico saw a 30% jump in FDI, with the United States and Canada its top two FDI sources. So with nearshoring a buzzword, we expect this economic integration to just deepen. But we also cover a new era of trade disputes, because under USMCA, they've really picked up pace um, compared with NAFTA. There have been 17 trade disputes initiated since 2021, and we cover the three most watched cases on energy, corn, and auto rules of origin. On immigration, I'm sure uh, most of you are aware that President Biden made new announcements related to immigration yesterday, and that on Sunday, he plans to make the first trip of his presidency to the U.S.-Mexico border. So we talk about what's driving those announcements, and it's about more than just record-breaking border apprehensions. Migration dynamics have shifted with a far larger portion of migrants coming from beyond Mexico and Central America. But we also note that even with recent U.S. policies uh, seeking to stem migration, all three countries face labor challenges. Canada's economy lost an estimated 9.6 billion U.S. dollars in 2021 due to labor and skills shortages, in the case of the United States, as of the fall of 22, there were 11 million job openings, but only 6 million unemployed workers. And in Mexico, two in three employers reported difficulty finding talent in 2022. On security, much like immigration, we've seen headline news in the past 24 hours with the detention of Ovidio Guzman, uh, son of El Chapo Guzman. Um, in the brief, we talk about the dynamics behind that news, not only with an overview of how U.S.-Mexico security cooperation has evolved, but also by digging into the numbers behind the top concerns for both the United States and Mexico. On the U.S. side, it's the fentanyl crisis. In 2022, the DEA sees 50.6 million fentanyl-laced fake prescription pills. That's up from 20.4 million in 2021. That's just a staggering increase. And the doses are getting deadlier. Six in 10 of those fake pills contained lethal doses of fentanyl in 2022, compared with four in 10 a year earlier. The U.S. has had over 108,000 overdoses um, uh, last year, and roughly two-thirds involved synthetic opioids. Um, the DEA has, has identified uh, two Mexican cartels in particular uh, as producers of these doses. But on the Mexican side, um, armed smuggling from the United States has been a major worry. Roughly 70% of firearms seized in Mexico can be traced back to the United States. Um, and in Mexico in 2021, there were 36,000 murders. Two thirds of those homicides were attributed to firearms. The Mexican government has now filed two separate lawsuits against U.S. gun makers and distributors, marking the first time a foreign government has taken such action. In this brief, we also touch on climate cooperation, pandemic preparedness, and the 2026 World Cup. Um, but in the interest of time, I won't get into those right now. I encourage you to check the brief. But I do want to close with one important point. One important point. The topics I've touched on are really complicated issues, of course. And no, they will not be solved in a two-day summit. But it's important to note that while this is the 10th summit, 
these now summits have been going on since 2005. That means they don't happen every year. And we recently had a gap of five years since these same three leaders came together, that before these same three leaders came together in November in 2020 in Washington. And during that five year gap, some of the very challenges we cover in the brief developed or even festered. So bringing these leaders together gives them a chance to communicate and set an agenda for ministerial and other meetings and other ways to, to, to collaborate and tackle some of these problems, many of which are domestic matters for any one of these countries that really cannot be resolved without working with the other two. Um, so thank you very much for listening and I'd like to hand it over to Enrique. Karen, thank you. Thank you very much for your partnership, um, for all the, the Council of the Americans team. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, partnership. I think the, the this briefing uh, could be very, very relevant for many journalists or, or even many associations and organizations coming to this um, event on Monday, uh, Tuesday, and Wednesday next week. Um, we're I mean, I'm sorry, I'm Enrique Perret. I'm the, the head of the U.S.-Mexico Foundation based here in Washington. We have two offices, Washington, D.C. and Mexico City. Um, our main objective is to uh, increase the understanding between Mexico and U.S., and we do it um, through basically topics like trade, economy, migration, labor mobility, nearshoring, and, and, and security. Um, and this briefing is important for us to lay down, like Karen says, um, the context of uh, all the topics that we are exploring, very complex, very complex. Um, and every country is arriving with, with different priorities, right? Canada, US, and Mexico has different priorities in the agenda, but there is a common ground. And we believe that the common ground is competitiveness, is uh, its economy, its education, it's uh, labor mobility. It's also obviously the near shoring, ally shoring uh, concept. The, this opportunity, this regional opportunity that present um, us a, a huge advantage. And, and we hope these uh, different topics can create some solutions on, on this economy and this competitiveness. And um, there, there are many, many things um, you all saw the results of the previous meeting. I think we also need to uh, to push for the accomplishment of uh, some of those goals that were established or expressed last year. So we invited you also to review those documents from November uh, 2021 um, and to continue pushing for that for that agenda from exchanges on education to uh, more investment in the region, more development through the, um, uh, the exim banks of our countries, more uh, communication from the business sector, um, more communication from the social and civil society, and obviously uh, more transparency and more documents like this one that presents the different challenges. So thank you so much for your time and um, and with that, uh, Karen. Uh, next, uh, Louis. Well, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, Ada, um, for inviting me to provide the, the Canadian perspective. Um, and I'm happy to do that. Uh, perhaps just to start exactly with that point, I think that given um, the, the timing of this NALS, taking place just following a visit at the border by the president. And the president will be receiving uh, the, uh, the prime minister of Japan when he returns to Washington. The goal for Canada is probably uh, to carve out some attention and space at this, at this summit. Um, and uh, we, uh, the summit will also be uh, complemented by business delegation. There'll be business meetings on the day one. So there's three delegations from each, well, one from each country. So you'll have a, a really robust business angle to this. But for Canada, um, beyond carving out attention, because obviously we have a, a superpower neighbor uh, that Mexico and Canada share, will our priority 
will probably be in the areas of energy, for example. Uh, obviously, that's part of the brief that there is a bit of an irritant there. We'll look to try to iron out some of those irritants. I think on one hand, while it's, it proves 17 disputes or mechanism being invoked at some degrees does prove that USMCA Kuzma works. At the same time, it's worrisome that we can't seem to work these things out ahead of them becoming more problematic. Um, and I think I would want to also say that while the deliverables of the last NALS were very much, half of them were tied to the pandemic, understandably, there was a large chunk that I think uh, the business sector in Canada is still looking for implementation. It was very aspirational, but really not much has actually happened. So we're looking in areas of digital harmonization, the energy transition, really uh, Canada would like to see us to look at the energy piece as a continent and to work more closely together. This, the SME is, is really, we forget that the SME are the drivers of all of our economies. And if we don't really uh, foster uh, the environment for them, then I think we're missing uh, uh, part of the story. I'm pleased that the Canadian delegation will be hosting an SME uh, event on Monday, uh, which will be hosted by our Minister of Trade, uh, of International Trade, Mary Ng. So it just shows that for us, the SME development and the women, women, women owned and women led, minority owned and minority led companies is a priority. And I think I would want to add from the business, business perspective, we would like to see a little bit more in terms of the infrastructure of resilience. This is an opportunity when we're talking about nearshoring to really work together to improve our capacity, our integration from rail to ports and so on and so forth to reduce costs of shipping for our goods and services that are already trading quite healthily, but at the same time, make sure that we build in resilience in our supply chain. So I think those are the, the big the big items that I wanted to put on the radar screen from the Canadian perspective, and I'll be happy to take questions a little bit further on. Merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you very much, Louise. Uh, Eric. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it is a hard act to follow these uh, terrific presentations already. I'll try to add a couple points. Uh, my name is Eric Farnsworth. I head the Washington Office of the Council of the Americas. I've been involved in some of these presidential level trips when I worked at the White House in the Clinton administration. Uh, and so I have some historical perspective on this as well. And I guess the question is, what does all this mean that we've been talking about? You know, the news of the day is on immigration and also security, as has already been discussed. Those are clearly the headline grabbing events of the uh, meetings that the, will happen uh, this coming week. Uh, you know, that's a good thing in one, uh, one aspect, which is to say that these presidential level meetings matter because they drive the agenda. And uh, whether it's security or migration, uh, it's pretty clear that uh, timing on this is not a coincidence. And I think that's okay. That's a good thing. Um, but the bigger question has to be asked, what does all this mean? And, you know, North America, the potential for North America is immense. And so it's our hope that the leaders, when they get together, uh, to talk about some of these issues, keep in mind the fundamental vision of what North America really could be. And as we talk about things like supply chains, as we talk about things like global competitiveness and China, as we talk about things like finding the workforce for the US economy, we can't do these things without our partners in Canada and Mexico. Uh, it's just fundamental to our own well being. And so that has to be the underlying message of the leaders as they get together. Look, we all have our individual issues but we're not gonna be able to solve them by ourselves. We have to bind together and really work diligently to address those. So within that framework, uh, let me just offer a couple of thoughts. USMCA uh, was passed in the United States on a historically high uh, vote total, bipartisan uh, and uh, certainly something that uh, you don't hear people talk about uh, NAFTA anymore, because there is no NAFTA, but, uh, but USMCA has played a vital role from the political side what we have to do now and what we're hoping will happen in Mexico is that the three parties will recommit themselves to the full implementation of the USMCA because there are some challenges there. And USMCA has to be shown to work for the people of all three of our economies so that it's sustainable. At the same time, this could very easily prove to be a model, a workable, effective model to expand trade 
more broadly into the Western Hemisphere. Costa Rica has already requested the opportunity to join. So if we want to be creative and visionary here, these are the types of things we should be talking about and looking to do to really regenerate the sense of uh, trade as a leading indicator of uh, not just North American, but also regional integration. We also have to find a way to make our borders work better. Obviously, that's the news of the day. It's something that's always going to be with us. But the borders really should be things that connect us, not divide us. Why is that important? It's important because you know, all of the trade, by definition, that comes into the United States crosses a border. The borders have to work effectively. They have to work efficiently. They have to, we have to find ways to bring uh, labor into the United States in an effective way through uh, guest worker programs and, and the like. But it has to be done in an organized way, in a regularized way, and in a way that actually builds public support and doesn't erode public support. That's what I believe the president and the White House are trying to do with the recent announcement. But these are issues that really require, by definition, the full agreement and the diligent implementation by all three countries and all three leaders. And so hopefully we'll find some work on some of those issues uh, to, to be forthcoming. And then I think we have to acknowledge that democracy matters. Uh, in order for us to have a sustainable working relationship, our economies are different, our people are different, but we share values. And these things matter in terms of the sustainability of the broader relationship. Look, we're talking about this on the second anniversary of January 6th. Uh, there is no country that's immune from challenges to democracy these days. Certainly our own country in the United States is not immune. But at the same time, we have to find a way to, for example, clean up the brutal uh, campaign against journalists in Mexico. That has to be a high priority. It has to change. There are other issues as well. But the point is that, you know, we look at these things through the security lens, through the immigration lens, through the economic lens, all of those things are entirely appropriate. But we also have to remember we are three strong, important democratic neighbors, and that has to be ultimately what underlies our relationship. So on, back to you. You know, I think with that, we have run out of time. Uh, if you have further questions, feel free, feel free to uh, write to us. Thank you very much to everyone. Uh, have a good day.